So now I have an excuse to wear sandals next week. <laughs> okay? They will rue the day he said that, I can tell you that. No, no, thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really, it's hard for me to believe that I'm 39. That <laughs> continues. Uh, uh, tomorrow I'm 67. And uh, I came here when I was 28 years old. It been a few days ago. Numbers chapter number two. Thank you everyone who was involved in the music and all that um, you did there. I appreciate that. That was really, really good. And I am, I am so very, very thankful. Those in the back, I am, I have four points. I'm going to skip over point three, so just be aware of that. If you have to put it up, that, that's, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to go ahead and uh, put up that picture, if we could, of uh, the encampment of Israel. I want you to go to Numbers chapter number two. In Numbers chapter number two, we have a recording for us of the encampment, the arrangement of the encampment of the nation of Israel in their days of wilderness wandering. And the Bible says this in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard. The word standard there is the word flag, banner, flag, ensign. With the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And on the east side toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch without their armies. And if we go down through chapter number two, you are going to find what we have here. We have 12 tribes. When they are encamped around the tabernacle, you have three sets of tribes on either side. Let's take the tribe of Judah, for instance. The tribe of Judah, when it comes down to each individual clan or family, would have their own family flag. All right? Some of you, I, I'm, I'm laughing, some of you are thinking right now, Pastor's flag would have Duncan on it, probably. That is what you're thinking. All right. Then, and more importantly, all, all for all of the tribe of Judah, there would be one flag. And that one flag would represent the tribe of Judah. There would then be one flag for Zebulun, Issachar, for all 12 of them. So actually, the tabernacle in the center, some small tents around the tabernacle, that would be Moses, the Levites, and then the great mass encampments in the front of those encampments, um, there would be some kind of flag of representation that if you had an aerial view, you would see in the very center the tabernacle, and then you would see flags, and in front of those flags, I'm assuming, rather behind each of those flags, would be tens of thousands of each of those groups. The flag represented something very vital to them very important to them. We have celebrated our flag today. We are the tribe of America. 
if I can put it that way. And that flag stands to represent so very much for each one of us. But for the Christian, our statute of liberty is the cross of Jesus Christ. We sang a song this morning, listen for a moment, to the soldiers of the king as an ensign fair we lifted up today, while as ransom ones we sing, marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner, the flag of the cross. For each one of us, if you would, we honor the cross by carrying the symbol of the cross as our flag. But it's a truth that permeates our lives as believers. We honor the cross by allowing the flag of its truth to be able to change our own hearts and our own lives. We had celebrated here 13 folds this morning. Each one of those folds representing a certain truth. It wasn't interesting. That actually extended some of those truths from the time of David on till today. Can I say to you that the cross of Jesus Christ has folds that are representative I'm taking a moment and I'm going as a picture of some of that representation to where we are today in Numbers 2 and 2. Just as that flag stood in front of each one of those tribes, it meant something very, very special. So let me just share a couple of points with you, if I might, this morning. Number one, number one, this truth, the flag was a point of gathering. Gathering. Understand that uh, around that center tabernacle, and you don't need to turn it back, David, I'm driving him crazy back there. I can see that. Uh, around that central tabernacle, there was that tribe, and that flag stood there. And as it stood there, when you bring all of the people together, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them together, they were gathered unto the flag that represented their tribe. We as Christians, we gather and we gather unto the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the flag, if you would, that represents our tribe. Think of them coming out of Egypt, being there no longer. That flag that represented the tribe, God had called them out of Egypt unto themselves. Each one of those flags representative of the call of God, the call that started with Abraham and down through time now had built a nation. They were proud of that flag. They were proud of the representation and what it meant. Can I say to you that Father, that gathering was what? Under the presence of God. Dave, can you throw that picture of the tabernacle back up one more time? I, 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 yeah, I know. I got him going and coming. Uh, I wasn't intending to do this, but maybe we can. I, I want us to picture just for a moment, uh, if you would, this tabernacle picture here. All right. <laughs> here we go. Uh, understand that is you have hundreds of thousands of people. When they gather, right, Judah is not going to gather under Manasseh's flag or Ephraim's flag. Judah is going to gather under Judah's flag. And as they gather there, understand that the center of everything is the tabernacle. They're gathering, if you would, under the very presence of God. 
not only is the gathering an identification for them, gathering unto who they are as a group, but they're gathering around the very center of everything is the very presence of God represented in the holy place, in the holy of holies, representing in the cloud and the pillar of fire. And as I, as I think about that, in this particular passage, it takes one verse, verse number two and three, or these two verses, to set up what God intended in the representation of each group. But it takes the whole rest of the chapter. If I'm reading down through here, another 34 verses to describe the arrangement that was supposed to be around the tabernacle. Well, two verses to say this is to be the center, the rest of the verses to show how the arrangement was supposed to be. Can I say to us and remind us as believers that yes, we honor the cross, but as we honor the cross, there's a whole lot of other scripture in the Bible that deals with the arrangements about how we're supposed to live our lives, how our lives are supposed to be directed. Chapter 2, if you would, is the small picture of the enlarged truth that even though the cross is vital, the gospel is vital, after the cross, if we're still here in this world, God has a lot of arranging he'd like to do in our lives. Amen. The arranging that God would allow sometimes there's calloused arrangement today. Why, wow, we're only going to do this on our terms, God. We'll serve you within this box, but not outside of it. We'll serve you at this time, but not outside of it. We'll serve you in this way, but not outside of it. I pulled in today. And the flags that have been put up. And Pastor Luke did, did such a great job. And I was actually surprised they were all standing with all the wind, etc. And I came in and there was one that had fallen. And I stopped. And as I was stopping, one of the elderly gentlemen, elderly gentlemen, forgive me for saying this, brother, stopped his car and said, Pastor, let me get that. You have other stuff to do. I want to get that. And I thought to myself, they respect the flag so much that he didn't want to see that it had fallen over into the grass. And he was willing to stop his vehicle and get out and improvise, you know, with something to pound that back into the ground. Servant. The flag meant something to him. But to that very same person, I know that the cross means a lot more. In God's own time and own plan, he has allowed the cross of Jesus Christ to be the center post for each one of us. And it's because of the cross that we serve. It's because of the cross that I try to deal with a calloused heart. Not only callous arrangements, but compromised arrangements. Around us, don't we see so many things happens, so many things happening, but it wants to anymore to be tied with the world. When you see the cross compromised, it's a sad view. There are church arrangements today where we take the truth of God and we, we just bind it down with our own tradition. And that includes independent Baptist tradition. We must realize the day and age in which we live. But maybe more concerning as I, as I think about this truth 
and gathered under the presence of God is if you're here today and there's also a calamitous arrangement. <clears throat> we all honor our flag. Everybody stood to attention. I was, I was watching as the men sang the introduction song about the flag, and I saw people wiping away tears. Why? Because the flag means so much to us in our lives. We respond to that. Can I ask you, if you're here today, do you respond to God's flag? Is there a response from you when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ? Please hear me today. Please hear me. There is a God of heaven that loves sinful people. I am one of them. And it's not enough to say, well, I try to be a good person. It, it, it's not enough to say, well, I believe in God. You see, one of the touchstone truths of becoming a Christian and, and of having your sins dealt with is the cross will be elevated in your mind. Amen. You'll get up and there won't be a day that goes by without your prayers being lifted or your Bible being opened or you're turning your life with certain portions of discipline because of this truth, the cross of Jesus Christ. And for the believer, just as surely as the flag is important and respond to it, the Christian responds in a stronger way to the cross. That's our flag. That's our flag. What is your life drawn to today? What is your life arranged around today? Neath the banner of the cross. Number two in, in the passage today, um, this is a, a larger point, um, not only was of the flag, uh, a gathering point. But number two, the flag, and I listen to this, was set up in reference. The flags back then were set up in reference to the placement of the tabernacle. Where the tabernacle was, the tribes represented with their flags weren't scattered hap hazard over thousands and thousands of acres. They arranged their flags in proportion to where the tabernacle was. Does that make sense? They arranged those flags in such a way that God has an order. And as a matter of fact, the arrangement was such that God placed them where he wanted them. Judah, if it were where Ephraim was, and Ephraim where was Judah was, they were disobeying God. Um, if, if they were all out here spotted, that's what not, that isn't what God intended. God intended that the flags would be placed up and the tribes would be set up in proportion and in reference to where the tabernacle was. Can I say to you that I have to respond and you have to respond in our lives. We address ourselves in reference to the cross. If I, if I have a Bible-based belief and my outlook is the Word of God, then as I live my life, not only is the presence of Christ a center to me, but it helps reference where I'm going to stand, where I am going to place myself, how I am going to live my life in this particular passage. In other words, there were boundary lines. There are boundary lines here. Judah 
was behind this flag. They weren't over here. They weren't mixed up. They were each separate groups according to this chapter. There were boundary lines according to the reference of where the tabernacle was. They stayed within the boundary lines of where their flag was. And we're called, aren't we? As Christians, as believers, you are called, what? To make sure that I'm constantly aligning myself at the right place under God's flag. You don't simply start your Christian life and throw the keys to that car to the side and live it any old way that you want to. The Bible says, take heed unto yourself. Take heed. What does that word mean? It literally means this. If, if this is me, if this is Steve Rebert, and the Bible says take heed unto yourself, it means this. Take a look every once in a while. Where are you? How are you living? Lord, and then I've got to readjust myself here. Well, I'm getting off course. And I readjust myself, not according to the local church, but according to the God of the church, according to the Bible of the church. Not according to Reber tradition, all right, or Chastain tradition, but according to the Word of God. Amen. I align myself according. So I take, if you would, the flag of the gospel, the flag of Christ that I'm to live, and I keep aligning myself that I'm exactly where God would have me to be. When I stand up and I salute the flag, I must stand up and ask myself what I've done with God's flag. That also means and I mentioned this, that everybody can't cross the line, has to be in their proper place. Well, let me ask you here today. I'm talking to you about your salvation. I'm talking to you about heaven or hell. I'm talking to you about your relationship with God. Are you within the lines of the grace of God? Do you stand within those lines? If the flag of the cross is put up, can you raise your hand and say, I am one of them. I am there. I am in Christ. I know him. I'm within those boundaries. You know, it's interesting in the New Testament, the king is bringing and calling a banquet. And there are many coming and gathering into the banquet. And it says that when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, my friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. You're coming to the banquet celebrate, celebrating the wedding, but you don't have the garment. And what the Lord was saying there, to the, particularly to the, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, all right, you're not going to gather unto myself unless you have the wedding garment. And the garment is the picture of God's righteousness. In other words, you can't gather unto me unless you're in Christ, unless you know him. Oh, away with this pseudo, pathetic, compromised, name, name God, if you would, Christianity we have today. That somehow, if I just name the Lord, somehow if I just believe God is a God of love, somehow if somebody's thrown me in a baptistry, everything's okay. No, it's not. Are you in Christ? Amen. Do you know him as your personal savior? Oh, just allow yourself to, to say, I'm not in one of those services, am I? I? I didn't know when I came here today, he would actually preach the Bible. This, this, this Bible from Old Testament, New Testament says God loves you. This Bible from Old Testament and New Testament has some lines that, that God is a just God, won't let you get by on. This is a plea this morning that there is a flag called the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's a plea this morning that you would just come, that you would just kneel at the cross. That as I can say, and we say, that's my flag, that you can say, that's my cross. That's the cross my Savior died on. 
That's the cross I'm concerned about. That's our desire, if you would, today. Lastly, the flag. Then... <clears throat> was a symbol of freedom. It is a symbol of freedom. In other words, <coughs> when they were, <coughs> they were the tribe of Judah were standing behind that flag, they didn't look down, they looked up. The flag was exalted. They looked up. We identify with that flag. That flag means we are free. That flag means we're no, under, no longer under the bondage of Egypt. That flag means that we have representation. That flag, if you would, is, is our patriotic view. It brings freedom to us. I was reading, thinking about our flag the flag of the United States, yes, it's a symbol of freedom. The flag's 13 red and white stripes represent the 13 original colonies. Its 50 stars on a blue background represents the 50 states. Each of the colors of the flag has a meaning. They might vary, but, but red, valor, bravery, white, some type of purity or innocence, blue, vigilance, perseverance, justice. Now listen to this. A star is added when we, a new state joins the United States. The last one was modified on July 4th, 1960. Anybody know the state that joined? Hawaii. You're right, Hawaii. It was the state of Hawaii. It was incorporated. That's the last time that it was changed. Can I say something to you? I'm glad that this flag, and I understand why it changed to incorporate state after state. There was a group of states, the first ones that joined, which the state of Virginia was part of, by the way. <clears throat> and it constantly changed to adopt and adapt, and we understand why that it did that we have the flag that we have today. But there is a flag that's never adopted, that's never changed, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. That cross has never changed. It doesn't need to be added to. You see, why? Because we serve an omnipotent and all-knowing, all-power, every, all-powerful, everywhere, present God that knew the gospel he was going to give for men to be saved from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Amen. The cross doesn't need to be adopted. It doesn't need to be changed. And in the midst of our, of our woke world today, that means we're really asleep the cross of Jesus Christ doesn't need to be changed. <clears throat> we sing on occasion a song that we've all grown up with. It's one of the great hymns of the faith. On a hill far away, right, stood an old rugged cross. We honor that cross. We remember that cross. It's not going to change. That cross is going to stay the same. It's the same when Jesus died upon it. If you would, the truth of those things carry forward to each one of us today. If you're here with us today and you come in and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, I'm not asking you to become religious. I'm not asking you to become Baptist. Nothing like that. I'm asking you today, as you've embraced the flag, would you embrace, embrace the cross of Jesus Christ? Would you allow that to be your representation of life? You see, on that cross, there are three wounds in that cross. Those wounds that, that pierce the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. That cross that I'm asking you to embrace today is blood stained. It's blood stained. Amen. You know, I had another cross I was going to use this morning. And I looked at it and I thought, isn't that beautiful? And the mountainside is beautiful. And I stopped myself immediately. I said, I don't need a cross like that. 
because that's not real. The cross is ugly. The cross is bloody. It's that cross that we ask every one of us to embrace. But there's something else about that cross that has the blood stains and the nail piercings. There's nobody on it. As much as I love our country, I love that flag. Don't you dare ever burn that flag in front of me. I, I love that flag. As you love that flag. But there's a flag that we love more. Amen. But that flag one day is going to go the way of all the earth. The United States as we know it will be lost as all nations on, on the face of the earth, it will not stand in God's presence. All will bow to him, and it will one day be gone. But not this one. I love that flag, but I understand that it is temporal. You're an American citizen. That is temporal. Where will you be a citizen of 100 years from now? That's eternal. Amen. Do you remember the second fold? It was in the flag as they were folding it. Remember what it said? It said this, the second fold is a symbol of the belief in eternal life. Amen. Eternal life, not temporary life. Love the flag, but it's temporary. Love the cross more. Why? Because it's eternal. And I'm, I'm asking you today to embrace an eternal truth. That Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That flag has seen its way a century plus ago through the fire of cannons, smoke, through swamps and on mountaintops. It's veiled by the hundreds of thousands, the bodies of men and women who have given themselves for this country. That, that flag has walked around the earth to give us freedom. That cross has made its way around the earth to give us freedom. A freedom that's greater than a political freedom. Remember, that's what the Jewish people wanted when Jesus came, and they thought that, that, that he was going to give them. He was going to give them something greater than that. And that is the freedom from sin and guilt. That freedom. Amen. In New York Harbor stands the Statue of Liberty. Can I say to us, to a world, stands the Statue of the Cross, the flag of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has done for each one of us. And so today, I want to read one verse of Scripture right now, and I'm finished. The book of Romans, chapter Number 10. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. For whosoever, in verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Amen. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so glad that we are whosoever's. Amen. If you're here today and you're under the sound of my voice, you are a whosoever. And on the basis of not 
what I see, but what the Bible says. If you will see yourself a sinner and understand that Jesus Christ died for you, He rose again from the dead. If you'll come to Him and, and, and confess your sin and you will call upon His name, He will save you right now. What a blessing that is. We pledge allegiance, we certainly do, to that flag. But we also pledge allegiance to something higher and greater. And that is a God who has loved us from the foundation of the world. A God who has provided for each one of us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes please this morning. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the hour in which we live. Thank you for our flag as Americans. But thank you more, more, Lord. Thank you more for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder how many of you would be here today and you'd say, Pastor, there was a day that I embraced that cross. I embraced that Savior. Would you slip your hands up? I know him. Thank you. I'm going to put them down. Would you be here today, just between me, you, and God, and you say, Pastor Robert, I am not sure of my salvation. Pastor, I'm just not sure. I have embraced the American flag, but I've never embraced the cross of Jesus Christ. I, I, I have never trusted him as my personal savior. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? I am concerned about that. I'd like to settle that matter of my salvation today. I'd like to be saved. I'm, I'm not sure about it, Pastor. Just privately between me, you, and God, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Robert, would you pray for me? That's right. Just hold them right up. Pastor Robert, would you pray for me? Yes. That hand. Other hands. Pastor Robert, would you pray for me? Yes. God bless you. Other hands. Would you right now, where you sit, just go through with this, with me, just privately, in your heart of hearts, if you raised your hand, you didn't raise your hand, and you're not sure about your salvation, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Would you say, yes, that's true, uh, preacher, I'm a sinner. I know that. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Say, I believe that. I believe Jesus Christ died for me. The Bible tells us that Christ rose again from the dead. Say, Pastor, I believe that. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that if you turn from what you're trusting, no matter how religious it is, how addictive it is, are you willing to turn to Christ right now? If you asked him to save you, would he save you? You say yes, then would you ask him? Right now, would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Lord, I turn to you. Have mercy on me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again from the dead. Lord, come into my heart. Lord, come into my life. Dear God, save my soul. God, save me right now. Forgive me. Lord, take me to heaven when I die. In your name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, right across the congregation. How many of you would say, preacher, 
We want you to know we asked the Lord to save me. Now, I just got that sure. I got surety. I got it taken care of. Just hold your hands up. Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Lord bless you so much. Now, Lord, you've seen the hands, and we're so thankful for what you've done there. And, Lord, we give you honor and glory for that. To those dear folks, you raised your hands. You got assurance. You're not quite sure, whatever that is. If you will see me, if you will call me, I will get some materials into your hands just to help you grow. I'm not going to call your name out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I never do that. But I want you, I want you to be sure. So just privately between me and each one of you that raised your hands, if you will see me, I will do my best to help you and help you grow. Would you stand with me, please, this morning? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to 